rounding out IPE, medical and pharmacy collaboration for improved student education and patient care. We have Drs. Daniela Bazan, who's in the Tamu College of Pharmacy and also at Doctors Hospital at Renaissance. Dr. Kristen Diaz-Rios, who is with the UTRGV uh, Doctors Hospital at Renaissance Family Medicine Residency Program Director. And then uh, Dr. Erica Torres, who is also at Doctors Hospital at Residen Renaissance and is a pharmacy resident uh, there. So we're really happy to have them, and um, I want to welcome them to pull up their slides so that they can start their portion of the session. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for having us today. And thank you to the IP ECHO team uh, for coordinating this for us. It's been a really good experience and we're excited to be able to discuss this with everyone today. So today's objectives include, um, we're going to examine an example of an academic rounding team providing patient care at an acute care hospital in South Texas. We're gonna discuss the different roles of physicians and pharmacists and how they can collaborate as a team assess how this experience aligns with IPE competencies, and then review some of the potential challenges that we faced and solutions to these, uh, to these issues. Excuse me while I learn how to switch slides here. That's okay, we're all learning Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Are you seeing that gray bar? I'm looking for it. I don't see it. Here we go. Okay, thank Excellent. you so much. Okay, so we will begin today by introducing our institution. We are Doctors Hospital at Renaissance, also known as DHR Health. That's a little bit easier to say. We are a 530 bed physician owned health system located in Edinburgh, Texas, which is a part of the Rio Grande Valley. Some of the programs that we're going to be talking about today. Um, recruit and receive applications from students from all over the nation. And so most of our marketing material, I would say, has this little picture of Texas with a star of where we are located because that's probably one of the most common questions we get is where are you? <laughs> where is Edinburgh? So as you can see there, we're right at the tip of Texas. Even most Texans don't know where we're located, uh, but we're right there, right by the border. Um, we serve residents, we serve patients all over the Rio Grande Valley. And our population here is approximately 90% Hispanic. Um, we do also have a large population of uninsured patients, which makes, makes us a unique population, but also one that provides a really good learning experience for our students and our residents. The hospital offers general acute care services and also has several graduate medical education programs in different specialties. We have affiliations with the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley Medical School, and we also have an affiliation with the Texas A&M College of Pharmacy, as well as almost every other college of pharmacy in Texas. We receive students here from, from all over the state. Um, I started here in 2016, and I was tasked to help develop the first PGY1 pharmacy residency program available in this area. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with what pharmacy residency programs are, um, students, when they graduate from pharmacy school, they basically have a choice. They can go directly into the workforce and start practicing as a pharmacist, or they can choose to do a pharmacy residency program. Um, the purpose of the pharmacy residency program is mostly to build on that PharmD education and help develop those clinical skills so that they can go on to practice as clinical pharmacists and provide patient care at the top of their degree. So we currently have two pharmacy residents, but we are expanding to four in this upcoming pharmacy residency year. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Diaz, who is going to introduce you to the Family Medicine Program. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Kristen Diaz-Rios. Um, I am the program director with the um, UT RGV DHR Family Medicine Residency Program. We are um, actually a very new program um, to this area as well. Um, we started in 2014 and we will be graduating our third class this year um, of family medicine residents. Uh, we have about six residents a class, so a total of 18 residents at all times. Um, we, uh, as family medicine, um, if you don't know already, we do a lot of different services um, where here at EHR, our focus is outpatient and inpatient medicine, as well as OB and pediatrics. Um, here at the DHR um, hospital, we work alongside our pharmacy team on the inpatient service. We're primarily only family medicine, so all the um, all the residents um, on the service are um, family medicine. And then of course, we also have internal medicine residents that also participate with the pharmacists as well. As far as our team of residents on the inpatient service where we work alongside the pharmacists, we um, have about four to five family medicine residents. Usually it's about two interns, which are in their first year. Then we have one second year and one third year. Um, sometimes two third years that participate as well. So going on to the second slide, kind of talking a little bit about um, what we do, and we're going to focus on the inpatient service um, because that is where we use our pharmacists and um, for this model the most. Um, we as um, residents and also as attendees, we do all the admissions. So when a patient goes into the hospital through the ER, and they're ready to be admitted to the medicine service, we admit them, we continue their care during their time spent here in the hospital, and then we also help um, discharge our patients as well. So part of our job would be initial and new orders, we do medication reconciliations, we um, are monitoring our patients daily by looking at their labs and imaging, um, assessing their medication needs and patient progress throughout the course of their stay. And then we participate in discharge planning. We definitely use our pharmacy team regularly and daily um, where we consult with our pharmacy, pharmacy team. Most of the consults may happen with our residents um, on their own. And then um, every day, you know, the residents show up about six o'clock in the morning. They get a sign out from six to seven. Um, they get new patients during that time. Then they have about two hours to see those new patients and see their old patients. At around nine o'clock is when our, our big team meets and that's again with um, our medicine team of physicians. So um, the residents with their one attending physician and then we also include the pharmacy team as well and Daniela will talk about them. Um, and at nine o'clock is when we do our really big rounding um, times where we really talk about the patients and what changes we can make for them. So that's the time when we really consult with that pharmacy team, but they're readily available to us at all times. And then um, again, depending on what we need for our patient, we'll do some education and join education with the pharmacy team. So what role does the pharmacist play on this team? So as pharmacists, we're tasked with being the medication experts. So our day usually starts with comprehensive medication reviews. Basically, we go through each patient and review all of the medications that they're on. And we're looking for specific things. You know, we're looking to see if it's interacting, if any of the medications are interacting with each other or if the patient has any allergies that we should be concerned about. Um, there's a lot of drug monitoring that's involved when patients are in the hospital. Um, one of the most common drugs that we monitor is an antibiotic named vancomycin that has monitoring that requires uh, a lot more attention and is a, a little bit more complex. So we have a service that, that deals only with that. Um, we focus in on dosing. Here in the RGV, we have a large population that has end-stage renal disease and that is on dialysis. So that oftentimes calls for dose reduction. So we always keep an eye out on that. We will review the patient's home medications, especially with our elderly patients. Sometimes they come in and they're on 20 different home medications and we'll review those and see, help the team manage those. 
see if there's anything that the patient doesn't need to be on and try to simplify that regimen and also help the team decide what should be restarted while they're in the hospital. We'll um, help the team out with medication order clarifications. So the medical residents are entering orders and often it's their first time dealing um, with medication entry. So sometimes it's just helping them navigate our software and how to enter those more complicated medication orders. Um, we provide drug information for them, so we serve as an extra drug reference if they need it. Um, and then we also provide patient medication education. So at the end of the stay, we'll often provide discharge counseling um, to the patients before they go home. So how do these two roles work together in a team? So there's different rounding teams that we have here available at DHR that see patients on a daily basis. The family medicine one falls under the academic team. So, and that, our little graphic there just shows sort of the hierarchy of our team. Um, we have our attending physician, which is our leader, which would be Dr. Diaz in this scenario. Um, we have the clinical pharmacist, and then we have our medical resident and pharmacy residents. And what I mean by hierarchy is that really it's the knowledge that's trickling down in this team. And so the way that we approach it is that our medical residents and our pharmacy residents are really the ones running the show. They're the ones that are making all of the clinical decisions. They're the ones that are entering the orders. Dr. Diaz and I are there and we're available when needed. We're essentially a safety net for them. Um, and we provide guidance and our expertise when that's needed. Um, and this serves as a model for our students. So our students are able to see the team make those clinical decisions and provide that patient care and solve those clinical problems in real time. So it works really well. One of the daily responsibilities of our residents is also to serve as preceptors for our students. So I know for our pharmacy residents, this has worked out really well um, because they're sort of so close in where they are. You have to remember residents are only a year out of school, so it was not too long ago that they themselves were pharmacy students. This really helps develop a good connection between them. I think our pharmacy residents are able to relate to them in a way that sometimes us more seasoned uh, clinicians are not able to. And that basically makes them be very invested in our pharmacy students' learning experience. And for our pharmacy students our residents serve as great role models you know they see them and think wow that's gonna be you know me hopefully in a year um, practicing at that and at that knowledge level so it works really nicely for the team and then I'm gonna let Erica discuss what the traditional team looks like so the great thing about my experience at DHR Health is that I really got to set a foundation, I feel, for what to expect uh, while rounding with the team by starting off actually with the family medicine team and getting to know this hierarchy and where pharmacists truly fall in the team. I felt that I was able to really carry that perspective over to um, my rotations where I started to round on a more traditional team. So some examples of those services would be like a general internal medicine floor, um, infectious disease rotation. That's very much um, the infectious diseases physician, nurses, um, and the pharmacist, as well as a, my pediatrics rotation, which also was with the pediatric intensivist, charge nurse, and pharmacist. So these teams, as you'll see, are a little bit smaller than our big academic training team. And the perspective's a little bit different. Uh, we don't necessarily focus as much on learners per se, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't learn from one another being on these teams. Really what the role is here is that um, we'll go room to room to each patient with our physician and the charge nurse, respiratory therapy, whichever other disciplines are with us will come along as well. And the pharmacist will be on that team as well. Um, the charge nurse is usually the one to present the patients to the physician and the pharmacist is there to consult on any um, changes to uh, medication therapy. So we all kind of work together. It's a lot of a more fast process getting through each patient. 
Um, I would say as a pharmacy resident, the biggest thing that I uh, contributed to these types of teams as compared to the academic teams is more logistics. So I, I kind of got to be that liaison between the central pharmacy and the physicians and the nurses. Uh, for instance, if there's a really complicated order that needed to go through for something crazy sounding like IV arginine, it was on me to be able to communicate, find out about it, learn what dosing, and also communicate it to my team in the central pharmacy so that we could all be on the same page and understand what's going on. So even though there's less of an academic uh, focus on it, I think at either uh, team you can learn a lot from one another and what we get to offer. Okay, so what does a day in the life of look like for us? So kind of like Dr. Diaz mentioned earlier, um, our residents are really the ones running the show and providing the direct patient care every day. So they are usually here before sunrise and they are assessing our patients, um, reviewing what happened in the last 24 hours, what changes have been made, um, assessing new patients if they came in overnight. And we'll usually have, depending on our census, anywhere between 10 to 20 patients a day that we visit. Um, so the residents will review those individually first. And usually they have students with them that are kind of shadowing and seeing what that review process looks like. As the pharmacist, I'll usually pre-round with them as well, usually about 8.30 a.m. just to go over what recommendations they have, um, whether that's appropriate. And also we focus a lot on communication, so how they're gonna bring up that recommendation to the team. Just to give you an example, if we had a patient that came in, let's say with a complicated UTI and was started on an antibiotic, let's say named Leviquin overnight, um, and the resident is reviewing that in the morning and assessing the patient and seeing that they have a history of recurrent UTIs maybe, um, and knows our facility's antibiogram well and knows that our resistance rate to that medication is pretty high and maybe a brand new medical resident might not be aware of that. Um, so now they're making a recommendation for an alternative therapy. We definitely go over how they're going to bring that up to the team. So usually about 9 to 9.30 a.m. we'll meet as our big team. So that's everyone, uh, our, you know, myself and Dr. Diaz, as well as our residents and our students will meet all together. And we go one by one. We discuss each patient in depth in great detail, um, create a treatment plan for them, discuss all the different options. Uh, and then we'll actually see the patient at bedside. And as a pharmacist, that gives us a great introduction to the patient. We'll usually um, go in or sneak in at the end and just introduce ourselves and say we're the pharmacist on the team and that we're reviewing their medications. And that serves as a great introduction for later on. Um, because during post rounds, sometimes we'll have educational in-services. I think that picture that's posted up there is actually Erica going over, I think she was going over like diabetes um, management on the inpatient side. And this is during one of her first rotations. Um, and then it's basically divide and conquer after that. Like everybody goes up and follows up with what they're supposed to uh, the medical team will follow up with their patients. On the pharmacy side, we'll go back and review the profiles again and make sure that any medication changes that we agreed on during rounds are, are, are done and followed up on. And then we also provide patient education. So as I mentioned earlier, we like to introduce ourselves to the patient, and that's because we'll go in later and provide um, discharge counseling for them before they go home. So we have a nice Excel template and uh, program where we print out basically a list of all of their current medications and we'll review each of those with them. So we went back to some of our learners and asked them, what did you think about your learning experience and got some really great quotes for this presentation. Our first one is from one of our fourth year pharmacy students this past year. He sent me DHR's rounding team showed great interest in my learning experience and growth as a student. The team truly valued my input and allowed me to work alongside them while therapeutic decisions were made. So I thought this was a great quote and I thought, um, 
I was really happy that Josh sent it in. He was one of our pharmacy students um, that actually worked with one of the first year medical residents. Early in the year, we got a very interesting case on a patient who developed pancreatitis and acute renal failure at, shortly after starting a diabetes medication. And so it, it was so interesting that they actually wrote up a case report on it. And the medical resident presented it at a local research symposium. And our pharmacy student presented or created a poster and presented that at a national meeting. So that was an example of a great collaboration they had um, after being introduced during rounds. Um, our next code is actually from one of our chief residents, family medicine, um, Dr. David Ramirez. He's our third year. Um, he put the pharmacy physician team is an invaluable resource for both patient care as well as resident physician education. It has become standard of care for the type of hospital-based medicine I am going to practice, and I made sure this was part of my contract when I signed with my future employer. Dr. Onita is actually going to be a hospitalist next year. Um, you know, so when you think about family medicine, we always think about an outpatient family medicine physician, but there's a lot of um, our physicians and our graduates that go into hospital medicine, and he is probably the biggest one proponent and the biggest advocate for um, this interprofessional um, rounding model and really um, has been a leader with educating our residents how to use our pharmacists well um, and how to work well as a team. And so he's been a, a great role model and um, helping us continue, continue this collaboration. So it definitely kind of warmed my heart to read that quote because having worked with Dr. Ramirez myself, I definitely know that this is truly how he feels. And it leads to my quote, which is rounding with the family medicine team has provided me with great introduction to life as a clinical pharmacist and has motivated me to become a role model for my students. Um, I've seen it whether with my students on the pharmacy side as well as with medical students and the medical residents that we work with. We're all colleagues, and I truly feel that all parties involved here have increased confidence in their respective roles, and they feel empowered to speak up to optimize patient care. So we all kind of respect what one another has to offer, and I think that I've walked away with a great understanding of what they do and that they walked away with a great understanding of what I do as well. So to sort of help wrap things up on this uh, section of the presentation, I'm sure everybody on the call is very familiar with the IPE competencies. And I think that's why we wanted to put this as a summarization is because these are, even when we were preparing for this presentation, it's very visible that all of these competencies are greatly practiced on a daily basis. I would say with us, very big emphasis on interprofessional communication practices. Um, like I mentioned before, a lot of what we go through on a daily basis is learning about communication and learning about how to communicate with each other as a team. And so we also wanted to include some lessons learned, some you know things that we've gone through and hopefully have come up with some solutions that can help other, uh, other teams that are trying to build something like this. So one of, um, one of the lessons or the challenges we have is consistency of members present and logistical planning. And this has to go a little bit with um, having um, in our model, as far as attending, we do switch every week. And as far as the residents, they switch every two to four weeks. So the team is constantly changing versus the pharmacy team, team tends to say the same. But, you know, luckily we have Daniela as our main contact with the pharmacist, pharmacist team um, who helps us um, make sure that um, we're on board with them. We're telling them the times that we're meeting. Logistical planning can get hard too. There's days that we are admitting and we may not round at nine o'clock like we plan on um, or we get caught up with the patient. So again, rounding can be sometimes earlier or it can be a little bit later. Um, and so our solution um, with it is really just flexibility. We need to be very flexible and we all go into it knowing that there's going to be some degree of flexibility and that can come from the attending, it can come from the residents, it can come even from the pharmacy team too, because we all have different obligations. Um, we definitely are very good, and I think it's been great to utilize 
um, communication mode. So I think we tend to use text messaging a lot <laughs> for us, where we just text message each other on a daily basis and let everybody know what time we're going around um, or if we're running a little bit late that we might be a little bit late so that we're not um, we're not disrupting other people's time they can do something else during that time um, so you know we do use that communication with text messaging at least with our teams um, but we also have to be aware that um, we need to be flexible with it the great thing is sometimes the pharmacy team has other obligations as well and we understand that too from the medicine side, but we definitely know that they're absolutely available to us um, during the working hours um, and even sometimes outside the working hours um, and on weekends, but um, we do know when they're available and we definitely use them during that, that, that time period versus trying to reach them later or, or on weekends. Um, and then we also integrate students into our daily workflow. So sometimes again, um, Maybe our pharmacist, maybe Daniela has something that she needs to go to or attend. Um, and that's when the pharmacy residents and the students actually come in and place and help take over that role. And it's, it's been working really well for the whole team. Um, next, we have administrative support. And this kind of has to do with um, money. <laughs> so that's kind of one of uh, the other questions that I often get, even from the family medicine team, they'll say, well, why do we get you? But some other teams don't, because unfortunately, not all of our academic grounding teams have a pharmacist that rounds with them on a daily basis, um, which is something that we're work on, working on, because we've seen how advantageous and how well it works. Um, and so there are a few ways that we've worked around that. Specifically for me, I know what's helped me is my affiliation with A&M. So I'm also faculty with A&M. So I have a co-funding agreement with them where the hospital and the university share the cost for having me on board. And that helps out a lot. So there are some alternative funding sources. And I think that this is a really huge sell for institutions collaborating with universities. Um, we also have our pharmacy residency program and because we do have a large population that um, comes in and, and we get funded for through CMS, uh, we do actually qualify for CMS reimbursement for our pharmacy residency programs. Um, so we get some compensation for that. And the third big selling point I would say or, or criteria that I would say is that we document, document, document. We document everything that we do. It just takes a few extra minutes in your day, but we will document any intervention that we make on a patient. It um, goes right into Cerner, which is a software system that we use, and that way it also becomes a part of the patient chart. So it, all, it not only serves as a documentation for what we've done for the patient, but also um, reports are run on that on a monthly or quarterly basis um, so that a monetary value can be assigned to that and we can see you know more or less or at least an estimation of how much um, we're saving with some of these interventions our residents as well as myself and other pharmacy faculty that are on staff um, are are play a large role in you know some of the committees here at the hospital so we also work on projects that focus on cost savings or improving patient care um, so all of our services and things like that are taken into account okay and i know that we need to definitely get moving on to the discussion so just to wrap up our last challenge that we've seen it's team dynamics so picture this, it's July, our, resident, our medical residents are new, our pharmacy residents are new, and our students are just starting on their uh, learning experiences. Sometimes we're all just kind of trying to learn our place on the team and what it is that we have to offer as well as what it is that everyone else has to offer. And really our solution here has just been open communication. If you're confused on something, ask. Ask your preceptor, ask your attending, um, I also found it very helpful to ask my fellow, um, you know, my colleagues on the team, if I'm unsure of my role on the team, I may ask the medical residents, what would be the most helpful for me to offer to you guys? Uh, what would you like to learn about? What can I bring to this team? And I know for a fact that the medical residents would do the same thing for me. So I think that just being open that way and being a good role model for the students on the team would definitely help to, uh, you know, move through those initial challenges where we're all trying to figure everything out.
Okay, so now we'll go ahead and move into our discussion section. Christine, did you want us to go over these questions or are we taking questions from the group? We can invite folks to um, submit any questions based on your presentation so far. And then if they don't have any specific questions, we could use these. But I would invite all of the participants to either uh, put a question in the chat or just go ahead and speak up or um, go ahead and raise your hand. And you know, we'd love to hear your questions about uh, the great work that this panelist is doing. Perhaps folks are digesting their lunch. <laughs> um, why don't you? Why don't we go ahead and address some of these questions and um, hear from folks about what their responses are to these questions? Sure. So for the first question that we listed is: Is this a model you feel can be implemented at other institutions or other specialties? Um, and it definitely is, even if you don't necessarily have medical residents in your hospital. Um, the, the last hospital that I worked at um, did not have as robust of a clinical pharmacy service team, um, but usually what we found, and, and Dr. Diaz and I talked about this because she also used to work at a more rural hospital, is um, that if your hospital can afford one FTE for a clinical pharmacist, they'll usually put them in the critical care setting because those are your most complicated patients. So I would say most hospitals at least have a pharmacist rounding in the critical care units. Um, if not, don't forget that we every hospital has a central pharmacy, so there are always ways to bring them into the picture, even if it's just calling them for a phone consult. Um, and getting their help that way. Um, it can definitely work for other specialties. We currently have pharmacists in most of our floors, uh, but I know we have had inquiries from our specialties on um, whether we can get a pharmacist going with them. So there's definitely the need for it. I'm wondering if there's anyone uh, in other disciplines at Texas A&M, or we have, certainly we have, uh, a few other institutions on on the session here. And I'm wondering if they can imagine this model being implemented um, in their areas or in their institutions. And I hope that uh, the gentleman from UT Tyler doesn't mind me picking on him a little bit uh, because I believe he was in pharmacy. Jose Vega? Yes. <laughs> Surprise. Uh, say, I'm just wondering if um, this particular model might be something that you could imagine implementing at Tyler. Um, I'm not, I don't, currently don't have a practice site personally, so I'm not okay. totally familiar with how the hospital rotations are set up. Um, I do know that there's um, pharmacy residents, um, and we will hopefully soon um, start a medical college here as well. So I, I could see something similar working. Currently, I don't know exactly what the details are of what we have in place. Sure. Thank Chris, you. Chris, this is awesome from the College of Pharmacy at A&M. Um, I want to I wanna speak to this because I, I usually have these conversations with some of our partner institutions, especially about the funding piece. You know, the money is what it comes down to in a lot of cases. And I think once an institution gets beyond oh. that hump of how do we pay for it? How do we justify the cost? It, it, the, the floodgates are open and there's a lot more collaboration. And DHR has been that way with us in terms of residency programs and we're looking at adding another co-funded faculty member in infectious disease. Mm. Um, so I encourage any providers out there that are on the call or listening in, um, be patient enough to have the conversation about the funding because the value and the payoff is so huge uh, after you've overcome that, that hurdle. Um, and, and I think it, it pays back dividends, uh, not just from a teaching standpoint, but also from a patient care standpoint uh, and possible revenue generation uh, in terms of bringing in research projects, et cetera, to help justify the cost. 
Uh, so that's something else that, that, that I would encourage uh, my colleagues out there to consider as well. Thanks for that input, awesome. Um, I'm noticing too that um, Danette from Texas Tech has a question. Danette, do you want to um, pose your question? I know you've got a gaggle of kids around. <laughs> I do. Um, I'm a little bit removed from um, our residency coordinators. Um, and we work with them when we're providing IPE activities to meet their program requirements. So, but as far as the details that you guys are describing about how you do that with rounding, I'm not familiar with. We may be doing something similar where maybe we just get involved to a certain degree. Um, my question is, is this, uh, is this um, a model or something that could be used to, um, I hate to say check the box because these are real patients, um, but to meet an IPE credit or requirement from a program, do you think that could be done? Are you already doing that? Is that just part of doing rounds? I may be um, mumbling, but if that makes sense. No, it, I think it absolutely does. And I think I saw Awesome giving a thumbs up. Uh, Dr. Dr. Bazan, did you want to respond or Dr. Abu Baker? <laughs> awesome, you want to respond? <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is, it makes me laugh because this this was IPE before there was an IPE, mm -hmm. um, and and because for us for the College of Pharmacy, um, all of our experiences, clinical experiences in hospitals and clinics are based on the interprofessional team working together, and it is a box to check off. But I think where we have not done enough is actual assessment from an IPEC competency standpoint. Mm -hmm. We haven't really drilled down on it because we know it does. And if we know it does, why would we have to assess it? So I think that's, that's where we've fallen short in some cases. But this absolutely does check off the box and it creates that interprofessional environment. And, and I, I chimed in because I see this in every single experience uh, that we send our students to all throughout the six regions that we have. Who does? Uh, so absolutely, just we got to work through the details of it sometimes. Danielle, I'll let you speak to it a little bit. And just to kind of add to that is somebody who has uh, not too long ago graduated from a college of pharmacy. Um, I just want to say that this kind of model really kind of like set everything that I read about on paper or sat through class learning about. It all came together once I actually was living it on round with the residents, with the attendings, with my pharmacist preceptor. So I absolutely believe that this checks the box strongly, um, probably more so than my formal IPE um, activities that I had while I was in pharmacy school. Typically those were kind of a big, you know, room full of uh, nursing students and we would kind of talk about what we do, but we wouldn't actually do it together. So this actually doing it together is awesome. And I'll chime in on from the medicine aspect of it. I think it's absolutely essential to start getting our residents and, you know, our physicians used to using their team members and get away from that hierarchy that used to be the physician does everything, which is not the case. And we're more of a team, we're all on the same level with different roles and responsibilities. And I think it really does help with our resident education um, and medical student education and helping them learn that value that we need to start depending on each other and not recognize, not realize, or not try to do everything on your own. You need your social workers, you need your pharmacist, you need um, your nurses, um, your aides, you need the whole team. And it's not you alone. Um, and you need, to, you need to be respectful of the decisions and the recommendations that others may have and, 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 and take, it, take it as a serious and a really good recommendation. So I think it's really helped our residents learn that team approach. We in our program have a team approach even in our outpatient setting with behaviorists and pharmacists as well. Our residents are very lucky. Um, and we've been very lucky to continue to have it in the inpatient setting. So um, I think it really helps them when they leave and they become physicians on their own to um, use, use our resources well um, and use um, the specialist well. 
I wonder if um, Morgan, as, as the, the pharmacy student who is on the session, um, this, is, this is the price you pay for, for having me introduce you. Um, I'm wondering if what this model says to you. Um, is this something that um, you could see um, really enhancing your education, participating in something like this? Maybe you can speak a little bit about that. Um, yes, so I actually attended the Texas A&M Disaster Day. Mm -hmm. That was a really interesting uh, interprofessional simulation and that was really enlightening. Like I learned a lot from that experience and I'm really looking forward to doing more. This is my first year, so just trying to go all in on everything. <laughs> That's great. Thanks for your response. We appreciate that. Um, one thing that I, I heard Dr. Abu Baker say is, um, or, or address is, is assessment um, of, of, of this. And, and I know what you know, I know what you mean when you say we know that it is absolutely addressing the IPEC core competencies of teamwork and interprofessional communication, mutual respect, um, and, and certainly, you know, understanding each other's roles and responsibilities. We, you had that slide about what the physician's responsibilities were and what the pharmacist's responsibilities were. Um, I'm wondering how, what, what you could imagine for assessment of a program like this. And I, I address that to anybody on, on the call. <laughs> So as a, as a pharmacy resident, um, what the ASHP um, approved or certified programs, I forget the word, oh my goodness, but um, there's this thing called Farm Academic where basically um, with every single learning experience, uh, the resident is evaluated on how they perform during that learning experience. Um, so that's kind of a way to, even though there's a bit of subjectivity to it because um, these are soft skills that we're talking about. We're talking about communication. We're talking about leadership on rounds. We're talking about ability to work in a team. Um, but I do believe that Farm Academic does kind of find a way to help make it into an objective piece in a way. And I believe that if pharmacy residency programs are able to come up with a way to grade their residents, for lack of a better word, I do believe that we can come up with something similar for our students to assess them in this kind of setting. Yeah, I think that's a great point because uh, when we assess our residents, it certainly fits into their objectives on working and communicating with a team um, and all of their rotations are sort of built off of that. For our students, I mean, I think that the the assessments that are currently available and that have been developed would could easily be applied here in this situation. Dr. Kesterkey, I think you had your, your hand up or you had a question. Yeah, Chris, uh, this is Dr. Kesterkey up in, in Dallas at the College of Dentistry, and I, I'm not a clinician. I, I teach primarily for second, third years, uh, but I do teach in residency courses, and I'm wondering if this is something you could envision at, at the, the undergraduate level, the, you know, the, the dental medical pharmacy students, and what could be provided and where in the curriculum we could provide this, because having worked a little bit with IPE. I know some, uh, I know College of uh, the uh, Dental Hygiene Program, for example, has extensive IPE training, but those of us in dentistry, I mean, it seems like this gets pushed a little towards the wayside in favor of sort of the board competencies. I was wondering if that's something we, you can envision addressed there. Yeah, what's specific to the pharmacy curriculum is that we actually do get pharmacy students that are in all levels of their education. So after their first year, they do it, it be your introductory um, experiences. And, you know, that's for them to get introduced to this type of environment. So I know the IPI students that we get here, they will spend a majority of their time inside the pharmacy and just, you know, learning their workflow process. But we also like to introduce them to this team dynamic um, in providing patient care. So we'll usually bring, a, bring them along with us so that they also get introduced to that. Um, and then they also come during their third year a pharmacy school to also kind of get an introductory experience um, to working in a clinical team. 
So I know for pharmacy, we, we sort of have that where they get it sprinkled in throughout their curriculum. And then of course their last year, it's nothing but these, these types of experiences. Yeah, and, and the medical school, uh, medical school setting for you and me, we actually have, um, well, they have a clinical or a, a pharmacist as well. His name is uh, Adrian Sandoval. And he's the one that actually leads the UME aspect of education for the medical students. And I believe he also teaches courses um, with the PA school as well. Um, and it's just one of him, but he does do the pharmacy courses. And then he also does um, the third and the fourth year where they spend a month with him um, doing some clinical pharmacy within the outpatient family medicine clinic. Um, and that's something of a model that maybe in the dentistry school that they can create as well. But um, he is definitely a, a full-time faculty and he is underneath the Department of Family Medicine um, in his role with the university in the medical, edu in the undergraduate medical education aspect. And he's one of our graduates. <laughs> He's wonderful. We are super, super lucky to have him and Daniela. We're, we're very lucky with our program. Well, yeah. one thing that I kind of noticed from the question was um, there's a little bit of an aspect of is this something that may be able to be sprinkled into undergraduate somehow? And I think that that's been a, a little bit of a challenge, like not just for dentistry, as you were saying, but I would say all around. Um, in my experience, I really didn't get a whole lot of interprofessional education until I was actually accepted into pharmacy school. But I think the great thing is that the programs do make an effort to introduce us to our fellow healthcare professionals very quickly once we are accepted into those programs. So maybe if this is something that you're feeling like may have been going to the wayside in dentistry, it might be good to try to build it in in those early years if um, the students are coming in with minimal experience. And not to keep going back to, to the dentistry piece, but, uh, you know, part of it is making an effort to think of a situation or a setting where you could have these uh, interprofessional collaborations because dentistry and pharmacy does not naturally go together. But uh, I'm willing to bet that if, 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 if in dentistry you're considering patients and some of their chronic diseases and how they might impact their, their, their dental um, uh, disease states or chronic conditions, then you might want a pharmacist to look over their medication list and tell you whether or not there is any kind of risk for bleeding, et cetera. And again, I, I, I'm not, that's not my area of practice, but, but there's probably some questions that you might have in dentistry. So, and I say that just to highlight the fact that it might take some thinking outside the box in some cases to consider whether or not, um, whether or not we, we, we have an opportunity to collaborate on something. And, well, thank you. That's, that's, uh, I think that's a really, really good point. We do, you know, there is sort of a, sometimes almost a disconnect with, with dentistry. And again, I'm not a, a clinician. I teach the first year, second years, and I, and I see uh, IPE as, as, as such a valuable tool. We do have a, a really, really large residency program. Uh, with all the subfields of, of dentistry, and, and we do have uh, many that go off into surgery and hospitalist uh, settings. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's. I guess for me, some of it was the almost the disconnect, not disconnect, the the uh, distance between pharmacology courses versus actual IPE with a pharmacist. So, but thank you for the response. It's all very good. Thanks. Well, we need to start wrapping up. Um, and I was very excited about this particular talk because I think it's, uh, it was a wonderful way to highlight um, the ways that both interprofessional collaboration happen through practitioners and residents, but also the interprofessional education that can happen in that model for our, our students. Um, so I really appreciate that uh, about what, what you all are doing. Um, I'm wondering if anybody from the, the presenters, if you have any final comments before I move on to some closing slides. 
Um, so just our final recommendations, all stuff that we sort of touched up on during our presentation, but our big takeaways to remember to appreciate each other on the team for the role that they play in patient care and education. Um, we all have our roles to play, so just um, having a mutual respect and understanding of that. Um, we always try to tell um, all of our team like to support each other rather than trying to impress each other. We do sometimes run into that dynamic where there's a little bit of competitiveness, but um, thankfully it hasn't been too much. Honestly, this the family medicine team is like the nicest group of people I've ever worked with, and I feel so lucky to be, you know be working with them on a daily basis. Um, but to go with that, it really comes from the top. I think that the dynamic that I have with all of the attending physicians um, really just kind of rubs off on the rest of the team and they all sort of follow our dynamic and our mutual respect for each other and what we do. And then the last thing is just um, to always you know, document and report what you're doing, especially as a pharmacist. I mean, our positions, everything is always documented <laughs> and accounted for, but that's not always done in pharmacy. So it's very important um, to keep your program sustainable and to make it viable for more growth and, and more opportunity. Well, thank you so much to doctors uh, Bazan, Torres, and Diaz. Diaz. I appreciate so much uh, the work that you put into this and your time uh, that you shared with us today. I just want to close with a couple of uh, announcements. We do have one more uh, Project ECHO session tomorrow um, uh, that is going to be looking at nutrition and oral health care. Um, so this is very exciting, um, and given some of the questions about uh, dentistry, that may be um, something interesting to many of you. So be sure to mark your calendars and register if you haven't already. Um, and then finally, thank you to everybody who participated. We appreciate your time as well. If you want to contact anybody about today for the interprofessional rounds, you can contact Dr. Bazan. For Project ECHO questions, you can contact Dr. Beard. Um, and for anything related to the Office of Interprofessional Education and Research, you can contact me. We will be sending out a very brief Qualtrics survey. We would appreciate your feedback so that we can improve our efforts. Again, thank you. It is now 1.30, so we will be signing off. Everybody have a great day.